Hello, I'm Henry Bonsu and this is Doubling Down, where every week we tackle a topic that's got you talking on social media and beyond. Joining me today are Ben Ryan, Head of Research at Theos, a Christian think tank. Linda Smith, a lecturer in broadcast journalism at Bournemouth University. And the author and blogger Richard Phillips. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Really good to see you. Thank you. Now, of all the great international awards around, it is considered the most prestigious. Since 1901, 585 Nobel Prizes have been awarded to 923 outstanding achievers, drawn from the arts, sciences and politics. But of all the Nobel categories, it is the Nobel Peace Prize that is the most celebrated and the most controversial. While some peace laureates, like South Africa's anti-apartheid hero Nelson Mandela, the legendary Russian reformer Mikhail Gorbachev, and the Bangladeshi social entrepreneur Muhammad Yunus have received near unanimous approval. Others like Henry Kissinger, Barack Obama and Malala Yousafzai have attracted criticism for being totally inappropriate or ludicrously early. But the furore over the 1991 award to Aung San Suu Kyi has dwarfed all others because whether through omission or commission, she presides over the massacre and ethnic cleansing of Myanmar's Muslim population. Around the world, the calls grow for this former darling of the West to be stripped of her award. But the Nobel Committee says there is no mechanism for doing this. So is Alfred Nobel's legacy being betrayed by such scandals? Or does the power of the prize remain? So first question to you, panel. I'm going to start off with you, Ben, because you've been writing about this for Theos. Um, is it a good thing in principle to have a prize uh, to reward people who have, and I quote, conferred the greatest benefit on mankind. And in this case, we're talking about the greatest peace benefit. Yes, oh, I think it is, but I want a caveat. That, oh, we want um, caveats already. Yeah, already. This is very we'll early start to start a caveat. caveat. Okay, go on. So I think peacemaking is an innately kind of political claim. Like that is to embody a particular uh, idealistic and in some ways ideological approach to, you know, one person's peacemaker is not another person's. Yeah. It's about a particular construction of how you deem the best circumstances for peace. Mm -hmm. The Nobel Prize very much embodies a kind of um, Scandinavian social democratic approach to these things and it, it's very much within that space and I think that's why you see organisations like the EU or people like Barack Obama are awarding it. Al Gore. Not, yeah. Al Gore. Yeah. And not, for example, uh, you might make the case that economics, that you know, capitalist economics has been a force for peace, but yeah. you know, that would not be a winner because it doesn't embody quite the same thing. Yeah. So, but I think and also economists can have their own prize, of course. They can, yes. naturally. I do think that though, but what it does do, which is immensely valuable, is that it creates an aspiration to something beyond the mundane. And so much of politics is seeped in winning that next election, mm -hmm. uh, caught up in the kind of everyday business as usual, that having an award which is about a real aspiration to a kind of utopian idealistic good yeah. is a valuable thing in and of itself. All right, but what about when you give an award to somebody like Aung San Suu Kyi in 1991 to encourage people, pour encourager les autres, but some years later she's presiding over a massacre in Myanmar, Linda? Well, the thing is, if you look at, look at the details of, of how the prize is given, in his will, Nobel stipulated that it had to be for work within the past year. Yeah. So therefore, it's for work that she did in 1990 and also you kind of have to have to ask the question is somebody um, discredited yeah. you know later on in life for you know is somebody discredited for something they've done in the past yes. because of what they're doing now or can you accept that at one time they were doing good they were working they were a force for peace well i mean that's an interesting question but in the case of Aung San Suu Kyi can you understand why there's a huge clamor for her to be stripped of the prize or do you think that in some ways there's misogyny going on because she's attracted more criticism than some other people who might be seen later on as ill deserving um, I, don't, I don't know whether it's so much misogyny, but I, I, st I still think that if you look at the details, you know, it's for work that was done then. So I know, but if you think about what's happened to those hundreds of thousands of people who have lived for many generations in Myanmar, they now find themselves in Bangladesh in terrible circumstances. But, you know, I still think, you know, if you look at, you know, it's for work that she did then, not what yeah. she did now. Um, and maybe she needs to be uh, discredited in a different way. You know, you can't take away something that is for work that has, that's already been done and was good work. Fair and enough. not, you know... A, a, so a partial defence, a partial yeah. defence of Aung San Suu Kyi. Yeah. What about you, Richard? What do you think? I think the Nobel Peace Prize is absurd. 
Right. I think that five Norwegians sitting in a room deciding who the most uh, worthy recipient of a world pe is, is just nonsense. Why is it nonsense? Because I don't think anybody needs, you know, no, you know if somebody, it, world leaders or whomever, need the incentive of winning a prize in order to deliver, you know, what a, a peace deal or something like that, I think it's just nonsensical. I think, first of all, I'm against all prizes, right. except where there's some objective measure. But there's clearly... No, I'm just telling you, Henry, right, right. I'm sorry, I don't... Okay. You know, the Nobel Prize for Literature is littered with people who've never won it, who are incredibly deserving, yeah. right, of a prize, if a prize. But, you know, it's always apples and pears, where it, uh, and that's the essential So problem. you don't see the intrinsic value no, I don't. of awarding I somebody or an organisation I think it's, I think, I think reverse. I think it's a disincentive. I think, a in disincentive. a sense that... I th or rather, it... it, it kind of muddies the water. People should be doing good, if that's the right word, per se. for its own sake. OK, Ben, what do you say? Well, hang on, let me just finish. No, 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 wait a minute. No, 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 you said something really powerful there. Ben, you must come back. Uh, I think that, you know, of course. Uh, no, no one's disputing that people should do good for its own sake. No one's suggesting that people should, only, should do peace in order to win a cash prize, and that's clearly ludicrous. But I think that's to ignore the, the power of symbolism. I mean, the, the world we inhabit it is filled with symbolic events and things, and that's, that, those things have power. We're not celebrating the fact that some, even particular. I mean, this is the thing with Aung San Suu Kyi. I mean, yes, in the past few years, you say this discredits this discredits the war, but for how many years was she an inspiration? Yes, look, when I'm, she was I'm, I, I, to let me just say that this. That is Hedley. powerful. I don't, you know, I think you're you characterised her completely wrong to begin. Oh, with. really? Okay. Yeah, because I don't think she's presiding over this. Okay, we've had a situation in America going on at the moment where the New York Times released a story from an anonymous member of the senior member of the Trump government yes. saying we are there to protect basically within there the American protect, people and the yeah. Constitution. Now she is faced with a military over whom she doesn't have control. Right. Okay, and she might be saying we've got a choice here. I can you know push them so far they're going to we're going to be out of power. But they're going to back. And I'm going to I'm going to run this uh, by you, Linda. To govern is to choose, and sometimes you have to make hard choices and. There is guilt by omission as well as commission. What about that? Because surely that's um, part of the remit of a prize committee. You're right when you say she got the award for work she did in 1990, in 1991. But when we look at her now through a very harsh lens, it's because she is in a degree or a position of influence, even if she's not the leader of the hunter that runs uh, Myanmar. Indeed she is, but I do actually agree with Richard ah. on, that, on that point that, you know, to what extent, what power does she actually have? You know, to be able to do something. All right. We'll leave that question hanging there because Can I just say oh, no, I want to, I want to, I want to broaden right. this for a moment, uh, Richard, because you know, yes, we have focused maybe unfairly on Aung San Suu Kyi, but the current controversy have reminded people of how troublesome the Peace Prize can be. Of all the six awards, including physics, chemistry, and literature, it's the only one presented outside Nobel's homeland of Sweden. The Norwegian Parliament appoints the five members of the Norwegian Nobel Committee and they decide who has conferred the, quote, greatest benefit on, of, on mankind. Critics say that's where the problem lies. One of those critics is the Norwegian writer and peace activist Frederick Heffermel from the organisation Nobel Peace Prize Watch and he joins us via Skype now. Uh, welcome to the programme, Frederick. Thank you. So, from your point of view, what is the fundamental problem with the Nobel Peace Prize? Did any of our panellists put their finger on it? <laughs> they have demonstrated perfectly what is absolutely wrong with the prize and how the Nobel Committee, the Norwegian Nobel Committee, has managed to completely um, uh, disfigure the prize and nobody has a clue to what the prize was intended to be. What, uh, what so do you mean she, nobody has a clue? I mean, they can all read the will and testament of Alfred Nobel. They can see the clauses and the parameters. In what way are they betraying the legacy of Alfred Nobel? You know, no, Nobel was an inventor, an innovative person, a, a man with fantasy, and he could envision something new and different in the future. And that was his idea. We have to get away from military uh, competition and arms races we have to the only security for people in the world is through cooperation through treaties through international institutions where they can uh, gradually remove all weapons and uh, that the um, uh, law enforcement in this uh, uh, international society is uh, left to a police force, an international peace force. 
Are you saying that the only winners you want to see uh, taking this Nobel Peace Prize are uh, like last year's um, laureates, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons and not, say, for example, Malala Yousafzai or Al Gore uh, for climate change? Um, because if that's what you want, it's drawing the talent from a very narrow pool. Not at all. And uh, um, the main thing is to promote the idea of a different world where we cooperate instead of uh, competing and uh, fighting each other and destroying each other. And, you know, there is no security in filling up the world with uh, all the most um, recent technology uh, and all the time um, uh, making the uh, weapons of uh, distra mass destruction, uh, spreading them in that way. So, so it, what it kind of winners would you like to see? I mean, what kinds of organizations or individuals would you want to promote um, as the laureates, say, for example, in 2018? Well, I, I would like to correct you on the, the idea of Malala Yousafzai. She was an excellent winner. Ah. The, the problem is that the committee did not explain why. Because Malala, she was against uh, weapons and war in her own country. She went to the White House on October 13, uh, 2013, and told Obama that you have to stop drone wars. They are only creating resentment against America, and they are producing terrorists. And the Nobel Committee could have appealed to the youth of the world to change their mindset, to, to learn that there is only one way forward for us to survive even, that to co cooperate, uh, to, to adopt the Nobel vision of uh -huh. a very different world. Well, um, to quote um, the citation for Malala Yousafzai, who won it alongside Kailish Satyari, it was for the struggle against the suppression of children and young people. And I think a lot of people thought that was worthy. It's just that at 17 years old or whatever she was at the time, they thought it was just a little bit too early. For the moment, Frederick Hefemel, thank you uh, very much indeed. Uh, panel, your response to that, because it would appear that Frederick wants um, laureates to be drawn from the community of activists who are really promoting peace and who are anti-war, as opposed to maybe yeah. celebrating education or uh, championing um, the effects of man-made climate change, as Al Gore was in 2007 or Malala a few years ago. I, I don't really understand that, that critique, because firstly, it doesn't seem that the current system that we have uh, prevents that from happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but secondly, I think coming back to kind of what I said right at the beginning, I mean, there is peace, which is when two people or more have people diffuse an active conflict. Relatively few of the winners have done that. Then there is peace, which is creating the circumstances which are most amenable to peace in the long run. That is a political decision, that is an assessment, there are various ways you can do that, but that is why you have things like Al Gore and the EU. These are cooperative organisations. Yeah. I, don't, I don't quite understand the critique that we were having there. These are people who are trying to create conditions conducive to prevent the conflicts which we all agree are bad. Mm -hmm. What did you make of the analysis, Linda? I thought it was really good, actually. I thought what was really interesting was the point about Malala, and maybe yeah. not enough was done to promote the fact that she won this prize and the significance of this prize for engaging younger people in politics, in peace. Mm -hmm. I mean, but it, it was global news and the fact that she was young and she had been shot in Swat Valley and um, she had, was seen as an inspiration to young people around the world and she, you know, she went on a global tour. I mean, didn't that come across? It did then, but... We're now in 2018, and what? She's still what, a headline it, news person. Every time she, you know, when she went to university, it was mm -hmm. headline news again. Whenever she gives a public talk, it's it's headline news. I think mm -hmm. she's a good example of someone who really has raised the profile. I think the point about her being too young is, I, I don't really under, see that critique. I think again, mm -hmm. peace but it, it is was not made. It, it was made at the time, Richard. Yeah. I mean, well, first did, of all, did you, you have an issue with a thousand people? If yeah. you went out and asked a thousand people under the age of 30 who Malala Yousafzai 
was, if you got 50 to tell you, I'd be surprised. The most of them wouldn't know who the Prime Minister was. Don't kill yourself. It depends. Most... Maybe if you asked in this country, but in other parts of the well, world, maybe, maybe they but I mean, the fact, well, depends which country. Yeah. The fact is that most people, um, you know, young people, are fantastically unaware about politics. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, uh, that's the first thing to say. Well, it depends well, on which politics. I don't politics. think it matters. In the, in the, it in the defense of my generation, that yes. is yeah. yeah. Sorry, no, 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 wait a minute, Richard. Nonsense. Go on. Sorry, Richard, it is, wait a minute, second, yeah, Richard. Wait a second. You've got to defend that. Go on. Go on. Yes, I mean, yeah. that, that's nonsense. I mean, but that's an entirely unsubstantiated claim. You're oh, just 50 other. There, well, there's nothing to back that up at all. She's headline news in many e newspapers. She's a kind of people read newspapers or, under the age of 30 or 40. Yeah. If you're asking, <laughs> going back to the original question about yeah. whether this award should be stripped from Aung San Suu Kyi, how many of the... First of all, the reason this is going on, the public clamour is because of social networking. That's the reason. Mm -hmm. There's this kind of sudden weight of numbers. Suddenly it's a story. Somebody picks it up. That's the first thing. The second thing is, as I understand it, the chief supporter of uh, Myanmar... It's China. Yep. China, under President Xi, is suppressing the Uyghur, Uyghurs in, in, you know, to an extraordinary extent, yep. putting them into prison camps, as I understand it. Who is complaining about that? Mm -hmm. Who's complaining about yes, that? Yes, I mean, what I'm trying to say is all the, you know, it's, it's a popular cause. Aung San Suu Kyi will bring her it, down. It's, it's because she was so celebrated. She yes, was called the Burmese Mandela. And that's she spent that, years yeah, and years under yeah, house arrest. Indeed. Her husband died of cancer and she right, couldn't that's right. see him. Yes, indeed. Which is why people are so shocked by what they're seeing now. But I now. think it's completely... Because the reversal is so huge. No, n'est-ce pas, Linda? I mean, that's the quiz, isn't it? It is, but I'm going to... You know, I don't want to sound repetitive, but I do think, you know, maybe there has to be a distinction between then and now. And I don't think, because of the way the prize is structured, that you can take it away. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the possibility then, and I'm going to throw another uh, grenade into this oh. again, of uh, Donald Trump, because he has been nominated and it's not just a spoof. Some people are saying that his efforts to create peace on the Korean Peninsula and for the broader world, as far as nuclear is concerned, with Kim Jong-un is very, very significant and he's got further than other previous American presidents. Would that make a mockery of um, the Nobel Prize if he got it? Yes, because he talks about using nuclear weapons on people. So yes, mm -hmm. I think I think it would. But it, I think. But isn't that part of a strategy to make sure that we don't have nuclear? Oh, war? I think that's that's irrelevant. I mean, you know, it's, this is you know, in, in my thoughts and in my words. If if you're prepared to threaten to use nuclear weapons, that's, I don't think that makes you a great advocate for peace. All right. Well, I, I mean, every the entire world security since the war, since the Second World War has been based on. M MAD, mutually assured destruction. destruction. Everybody is preparedness to press the button. So, you know, that's ridiculous. But I mean, it would be interesting. The anarchist in me yes. says I'd love him to win it because it would just show how absurd it is. That's because you love the disruption. But let's hold that thought there for a second. It's a very pregnant one. We're going to move on because <laughs> we want to see what you guys at home are saying about this on social media. Let's go to Twitter, first of all. And Tori says Aung San Suu Kyi should be stripped of her Nobel Peace Prize for two reasons. One, she's presided over the genocide of the Rohingya. Two, after being imprisoned herself, she's now imprisoning journalists for exercising free speech. Oba says, I don't think the perceived recent missteps uh, made by the Nobel Committee have irrevocably tarnished Alfred Nobel's legacy. Some truly amazing humans in the 20th century were rightly awarded this most prestigious of prizes. Patricia says, how did the Nobel Peace Prize turn into a farce? <laughs> Just nice and sweet there. And then on Facebook, Pauline says, let's face it, the threshold has got so low that peace prizes are being dished out to political leaders for little more than handing over power at the end of their term or not committing genocide on their own people. And finally from Ishmael, when a man like, like President Obama wins the Nobel Peace Prize and goes on to bomb Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, Libya, Syria, and instigates numerous covert wars around the world, it exposes the cancerous roots of corruption that have taken hold over every facet of our daily existence. There you go. Now remember, you can always get involved in the conversation on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram by using the handle Doubling Down TV. Well, Frederick Heffermel from Nobel Peace Prize Watch is uh, still with us. Let's uh, get a reaction from him to what he's heard. Frederick, uh, what do you make of uh, some of what you've heard, both from our panel or maybe uh, from one of our social media correspondents? Well, uh, 
as I say, the um, whole discussion, one has become accustomed to the thinking of the price as uh, being, uh, can, being possible to give for anything that is nice and good in the world uh, with no restrictions. Without any idea, you don't get anywhere. You have to have a certain uh, goal and a certain purpose, and Nobel had that when he established the price. It's only that the Norwegian politicians have taken over the price and they use it for whatever they like. You can go on giving that price for 300 years in the way you're doing now and it won't make any really important change. So are you calling for the award to be taken out of the hands of the Norwegian parliament and the committee it appoints? And if so, then given to whom? It's not clear who should do this, but uh, we have just had a, a discussion in the Norwegian, in a group inside the Norwegian parliament with all parties represented, where the uh, majority of uh, almost all in the parliament uh, said that they are not interested in following Nobel's testament. Uh, um, a group of, uh, uh, there were two persons in parliament. Uh, two small parties with one par person each who said that uh, they we must um, see to it that the members on the nobel committee are uh, committed to they understand nobel's idea and they are committed to fulfilling it and to promote it this is an obvious uh, legal obligation and when uh, two, 104, 160 uh, parliamentarians are not willing to uh, do what their law says about uh, bodies in a, uh, ex uh, that are take part in the execution of a testament when they are opposed to uh, respect the will. Then they have to give the uh, hand the uh, task over to others. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, for that, uh, Frederick Heffermel from Nobel Peace Prize. Watch, thank you very much indeed for joining us on Doubling Down. Now, there have been some notable omissions over the years that many believe the prize should have gone to. People like the Nigerian environmental activist Ken Sarawiba, like Pope John Paul II, who was seen by some as a transformational leader, and probably the most widely discussed omission, Mahatma Gandhi, the great pioneer of non-violent civil disobedience against British rule. So, panel... Um, what about your great omissions? Who are some of the people you think should have won this prize but did not? Uh, I'm going to start off with you. Ben, what do you think? I think um, one of the more remarkable examples of genuine peace building and reconciliation that we've seen uh, in my lifetime is, is Northern Ireland. Okay. Um, and I think that there's, there's plenty of scope there for recognition. I think Mo Molan would have been one who, who would have come to mind but others yes. too and there's but a story of redemption um, in John that Hume uh, win the Nobel Prize mm. John Hume there's a story of redemption there though and I think well. and as you get close actually it's 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 the later you get that in some ways you know, it's the last steps which are the hardest mm -hmm. um, and you know that's that's an ongoing story and yeah. as so many of these are I mean uh, this is the sadness with this prize is that so so little peace is necessarily durable things can change the next day but yeah. ne nevertheless I think those those last steps towards where we've got Northern Ireland to today, as someone yeah. with Irish roots myself, I think that is a, a really powerful example of something which which is deserving of some recognition. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm just, uh, just a reminder, John Hume and I think David Trimble at the time David Trimble, were, yeah. were, were given the prize. Uh, Linda, what do you think then? When I was discussing with this with Ben, I was saying to him, you know, because there have been so few women relatively who've won yeah. this, you know, who, you know, what women could, could we think of? Yes. But then obviously he mentioned Mo Molan, but thinking more widely, maybe... She was the former Northern Ireland yes, Secretary. Exactly, yes, exactly, and did incredible work. And I thought, yes, that's a really good idea. So thinking more broadly, maybe um, organisations and foundations, and we've got the Tim Parry, Jonathan Ball Foundation in Northern, in Northern Ireland yes. that has done incredible work in terms of peace. And it's not just been about Northern Ireland. They've kind of gone to many many countries around the world to, to kind of share their message and share good practice. Yes. So some, you know, an organisation like that, and there'll be many more organisations like yeah. that around the world who would 
benefit and may, um, as Ben was suggesting, create a, another legacy and something yeah. for everyone else to work towards. I'm just thinking of people like the late Wangari Mathai, um, you know, Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, who did win, and of course, former President Johnson Sirleaf in Liberia. Liberia. But yes, I agree, women are underrepresented. And finally, and briefly, Richard. Anybody, I know this is going to be difficult, who? <laughs> well, I'd go for Boris Johnson. Oh, dear, come on. <laughs> this is a serious he's a problem for a He's a guy audience. who creates peace wherever he goes. Yes. Yeah. He makes us laugh wherever he goes. But that, I, I told you, you know my position. I think the whole thing is completely ridiculous. I don't know why. I actually tell you, I do think I know why. Oh, I right. think if noble, Nobel yes. wasn't so much like the word noble, we yes. wouldn't take nearly as much notice of it. I think it's absurd. And I think that, you know, the quicker we get away from the idea that people need prizes to validate their actions, the better we will be. And that goes for the Oscars and for anything else as <laughs> Linda's well. Linda's got ten seconds. Go I'm on. going to disagree with Richard because I think what an incredible legacy. Yeah. To, that money could have been squandered, but look what it's done over the years. You know, it's gone to these, these great things. And, and if you extend it wider than the Peace Prize yes. and think about medicine and stem cells and DNA yes. and all these incredible all right. things that have happened. It's wonderful. Thank you. Linda, thank you very much. A great point at which to end. And that's it for this week. Thanks very much to my studio guests, Richard Phillips, Linda Smith and Ben Ryan. For news of next week's topic and to get your views in early, check out Doubling Down on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Till then, thanks very much for watching and goodbye.